Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for exploring the Lowell National Historical Park, Lowell's water-powered textile mills catapulted the nation, including immigrant families and early female factory workers into an uncertain new industrial era. Nearly 200 years later, the changes that began there still reverberate in our shifting global economy and serve as a living testament to the dynamic human story of the Industrial Revolution. So we're going to learn more about this National Historical Park today with Park Ranger Emily Donovan. So all uh, 150 of us or so who are watching live and the many more that will watch on demand, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Emily for joining us today. And Emily, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be with everybody from wherever you are. Um, I am currently sitting in Lowell National Historical Park in Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, and what Rob said was kind of a great introduction to our story. Um, but I do want to kind of start with what Lowell National Historical Park is all about. And hopefully I will touch on all these pieces today while I'm chatting with you about our story. So Lowell National Historical Park preserves and interprets the historic structures and the stories of the Industrial Revolution and its legacies here in Lowell. We serve as a catalyst for revitalization of the city's physical and economic environment and promote promote cultural heritage and community programming. So I hope to be able to touch on all these different pieces. Um, we like to say here at Lowell National Historical Park that the park is the city and the city is the park. So we are really looking at a very dynamic place that is still always changing every day. Um, you might even hear the sirens going by on Bridge Street right here next to me because I'm sitting right in the middle of this city. Um, and also just to note that Lowell National Historical Park, unlike some other national parks or historical parks that you might go to, we don't actually have an entrance gate. We don't have a specific one place that we are looking at. Um, we help uh, manage a historic preservation district throughout downtown Lowell. So that's that preserves and interprets the historic structures. Um, I am currently sitting at the Boot Cotton Mills Museum, uh, but we also have a visitor center and some other structures that I'll talk about as well. But just to note, Lowell National Historical Park is the city. So when we're talking about the park, we're talking about a city of which I am a resident. So if you have questions about being a Lowellian, you can also ask me those. But I wanna actually ground us and think a little bit about where is our story starting? And our story starts with the natural resource like some other national park sites. And our natural resource that we ground ourselves in is the Merrimack River. So the Merrimack River is uh, starts up in Franklin, New Hampshire where the Pemigewasset and the Winnipesaukee Rivers come together. And the Merrimack River Valley is very much a product of glaciers receding during the last ice age and carving out the New England landscape. Um, if you heard from folks from Cape Cod or if you visit Boston Harbor Islands, other New England parks have that uh, glacial story embedded, but actually Lowell National Historical Park does too. So right here in what we now call Lowell, Massachusetts, there have been humans living here for the past 12,000 years. So the ancestors of the Penacook people traveled to this spot on the Merrimack River because over the course of a mile, and I tried to pick this picture to show us, uh, the riverbed is carved out and falls 32 feet over the course of one mile here. And if we were standing in this very spot uh, of just a few hundred years ago, it would kind of look like something you'd want a whitewater raft down. It would be rapids over the whole mile. But again, 32 feet of elevation change happens here. That is a good chunk of the 270 foot elevation change that happens over the course of the Merrimack River uh, journey as it comes from Franklin, New Hampshire, takes a hook to the kind of left in Lowell, Massachusetts, and then empties out to the Atlantic Ocean in uh, Newburyport, Massachusetts. So grounding us in our natural resource, but it is the story of people here at Lowell National Historical Park. And when we're thinking about some of the foundations of, in particular, Lowell as an industrial city, um, you cannot talk about Lowell without talking about a little bit before Lowell. 
So our story of industrialization starts with the desire uh, post-American Revolution, a little bit after the War of 1812, People in and around the Boston area in particular, um, wealthy men are looking at how do we create an industrial America? How do we divest ourselves of British interests? In particular, thinking about the textile industry because you can't get cotton cloth from anywhere other than England essentially in the uh, 18 teen era. And so uh, the Boston Brahmin, Boston Associates, that group of people is looking at how do we do this. And one name you might have heard of before, uh, Francis Cabot Lowell. So he is part of both the Cabot family and the Lowell family. Uh, he is looking in particular at that question of cotton textiles. And so in the early 18 teens, he travels over to England and he sees these power looms in action. And some people say that he memorized the designs. Um, he was a very well educated man. He had a background in some engineering. Um, so he was looking at these power looms operating, generating cotton textiles, and he brought that idea back to America and in discussing this amongst his colleagues and his friends who had a lot of capital. Um, he also worked with an engineer, Paul Moody, and they create what is the first uh, integrated factory system in America in Waltham, Massachusetts. Using a nine foot drop on the Charles River, which you can kind of see on the left hand side of the image here, um, they created that first mill that incorporated all the processes to create cotton textiles. We like to say from bale of cotton to bolt of cloth, from bale to bolt. So integrated factory system essentially means that all these processes are happening underneath one roof or within one system. This is different than what uh, Francis Cabot Lowell and others had seen in England. In England, it maybe was a carding mill across the street from that spinning mill next door to the weaving mill. But they really wanted to put all of these processes under one roof so they could financially and also um, kind of for, for uh, Kind of perfection purposes, if you will, control the whole process. And they used that nine foot drop on the Charles River to create the Boston Manufacturing Company. But they wanted more. Um, and what uh, the Boston Associates, that's that group of wealthy investors. So Francis Cabot Lowell passes away in, I believe, 1817 or 18. Um, that group of colleagues of his, the Boston Associates, are looking to expand on this endeavor. They don't just want one mill. They just don't want one corporation. They want a whole city based on industry. And so they start looking around because they need, remember I said it's a nine foot drop on the Charles River. They need that falling water. The falling water provides the energy. You can push falling water onto water wheels to turn on your factory buildings, pre-electricity, so they're looking in and around the Boston area for a location that will suit their needs. There, there's the city for you. Um, so that will suit their needs, that will provide that hydromechanical power. And what they arrive on is uh, East Chumsford, Massachusetts. So in about 1820, 1821, the Boston Associates and their um, kind of project managers on the ground look at this area of East Chumsford, and it is a subset of Chumsford, Massachusetts, which I think we have some folks from Chumsford here today, uh, that has that 32 foot drop on the Merrimack River it starts on one half on the left hand side of my image, it, and then it uh, ends right where the Concord River flows into the Merrimack on the right hand side of the image. The other thing that they note here in East Chumsford is that there is a pre-existing canal, a man-made waterway, and that is the Pawtucket Canal. This was actually built in the 1790s as a way to bypass the falls for local boat traffic. So there was a series of lock chambers on this canal and it was used to have those barges gently uh, be dropped that 32 feet instead of you know, just going over the falls. Um, it's not a great idea. So that pre-existing canal exists. The community is also agricultural. So that's all different parcels of land um, by local farmers 
we often talk about Fletcher's farm because that's right where a lot of uh, the visitor center as well as the boot mills is located. Um, but again, it's 200 people. It's 1820, 1821. And the Boston Associates start buying up the land to start their planned industrial city. And this is just an image just to give you a sense of, you know, we say falling water has power. Well, what does that look like? Uh, if you stand underneath the shower in the morning, you can feel that hit in your head. But what does a whole river worth of power feel like? Um, and this image uh, obviously is from later in the 19th century, but I really like it because it shows us that moving water and that's that power, that's that draw, that's that magnet to the space that we now call Lowell, Massachusetts. So in 1821, they start um, buying up the land and start the construction of a power canal as well as the first mill building. And by 1826, so really just five years after the Boston Associates and their product manager start this project of a planned industrial city, you already have a mill building in the form of the Merrimack Manufacturing Company the associated boarding house company housing attached to it. And you can actually see St. Anne's Church, so a, a place for the workers to go to church, that's very critical, already springing up in just five years. This early part of Lowell's history is mind boggling to me because of how fast it all goes. It goes very quickly because that's what a large amount of capital, a large workforce in the form of um, immigrants and locals who are uh, digging the canals and building the mill buildings, as well as then the workforce to work in the mills, and also a lack of regulation. Um, there's no OSHA standards, there's no working standards, so the construction happens very, very rapidly here in Lowell. And just to give you a sense of that, right, let's go back to this image. Um, so East Chelmsford, Massachusetts, population is 200. Imagine you're 10 years old and you live on, maybe your family's name is Fletcher and you live on this sheep plantation and you're 10 years old and some gentleman comes and he says to your father, hey, I want to buy your land. He gives you a competitive price for it. He doesn't tell you what he's buying it for. That's interesting to note, uh, but he doesn't tell you what he's buying it for and you and your family move away. Maybe you go and you uh, move with family in New Hampshire or something like that. So this is 1821, you're 10 years old. Just 55 years later, you're 65. And you wanna go back to those, the, the place where you were born. You, you know, your mother and your father told you you were born in East Chelmsford near the Merrimack River and it looks different now. It's a whole city now. So you were born into a community of 200 you come back with your grandkids 65 years later, and Lowell is Lowell. Lowell is 70,000 people. Lowell is not just one textile corporation, 10 textile corporations that are each massive complexes with associated boarding houses. Lowell is not just one little sleepy canal that bypasses the falls anymore. It is 5.6 miles of power canals bringing that 32 foot drop, bringing that energy into the middle of a city, falling underneath mill buildings that are not just turning water wheels. By this point, they're turning turbines. And we also have steam power coming into play. That happens over the course of someone's lifetime. It's really rapid. It's really incredible. And it's also the first time, this is, everybody's always like, why are you a national park site? Well, it's the first time it's an entire city based on industry that was successful. So not just one industrial site, but this whole city was based on the cotton textile industry. And so there's some different pieces to this. There's some different pieces to this development and to this success of the planned industrial city. Um, and one of those pieces that is actually really amazingly all still intact today, even almost 200 years later, is the power canal system. So it does happen over time, you know, between 1821 to 1848 that the canal system is built, um, but you can kind of see through these images and with these circles of uh, where the uh, corporations were that it, it happens um, iteratively, right? It kind of builds on itself. So the Merrimack Mills is the first manufacturing company that's uh, built at the end of a power canal. And then we start seeing some of the interior mills. So places like if you've ever visited mill number five on Jackson Street, the Hamilton Mills, uh, the Appleton Mills, the Lowell Manufacturing Company, 
and then eventually Lawrence, uh, Boot and Massachusetts Mills. And many of these complexes are still in uh, use today for different reasons. But I said, well, I, I can talk forever about canals and hopefully you can come on a canal boat tour and see the actual structures. Um, but the canal construction, I really like to hammer home, haha, no pun intended, that this was done by people. Um, and the canal construction, canals are somewhere between 10 to 20 feet deep, um, depending on uh, the, which canal we're talking about. Uh, but this is pre-dynamite. This is pre-heavy construction equipment. Um, so this work is very dangerous work and it's backbreaking work. So the project managers who are looking to expand the canal system here in Lowell, so the project managers, I never say the Boston Associates because they really are the financiers. They have people on the ground who are doing the project management, including eventually Kirk Boot, Boot Cotton Mills. So the project managers um, are hiring locals uh, in particular, who maybe have had their land bought up or um, have an expertise in stonemasonry in particular, but they're also hiring uh, from the local, local being in Boston, immigrant population, and in the 1820s, it's the Irish. And so there's the story of Hugh Comiskey, he walks up with a group of 30 Irishmen, presents himself to Kirk Boot in a, in a tavern, they shake hands, and for 84 cents a day, six days a week, uh, they start the canal construction in the 1820s, which really is digging again and using non-directional blast power and using draft animals to do that work. Um, this picture is obviously from much later in 1901, but just to give you a sense of some of the scale that they're digging and just to put a face to the, uh, to the people who are doing the work. And the other group of people at this same time that is being actively recruited, right, we're building canals, we're building giant mill buildings that are filled with those textile machinery. We now need a labor force to work in those mills. Now, the Boston Associates, Francis Cabot Lowell, if you've ever read Dickens, you kind of have a sense of what it might have been like in England. It's really a cradle to grave um, situation of people working in the factories. And the Boston Associates and the people who are planning the city want something different for their grand industrial experiment. Uh, they want a labor force that is going to be fine, moral, and upstanding. They also want a labor force that can come in, maybe work for a year or two on a contract, and then go back to some other job. And so the labor force that they land on is young women between the ages of 15 to 30, this is 35, um, we call them the mill girls because that's what they called themselves in a lot of their writing. So when I say mill girls, I'm not being diminutive. That's what they wanted to be referred to. They thought operatives felt like a piece of machinery versus mill girls felt like it was almost, let's call it people first language of the 19th century. So they, uh, they recruited the labor force of young women, 15 to 35, to come and work in the mills. And again, they're signing year-long contracts to do this work. So it's a very, very much the idea of they could come, maybe they come because they need to help a family pay off a debt. Maybe they need to help their brother get through college. Maybe they need some place to go because they don't have any other family around. Um, but it really is very economically driven. This idea that a young woman can leave her family to go make a cash wage in what was really a credit or barter economy is novel. This is new. This is one of the big experiments of Lowell that pays off. And some of the ways that they are recruiting these young women is to say that they will be going, yes, to uh, a city, but also uh, to a place where there are opportunities and that they will also be taken care of. We call it the paternal system because the factory owners and financiers are really looking at how do we take care of our workers. And they do this by, if you see in the background of this image, there's the mill building, the Merrimack Manufacturing Company, um, which no longer exists, but in front of it is a boarding house structure. So there's housing provided for a third of their pay, uh, as part of working in the factory, you sign a contract, you also are, have a spot available to you in a boarding house. 
And this boarding house life is really, I think, critical to the success of having these mill girls uh, work in the factories. Factory conditions are very different from many of them are coming from farms. Um, so this is very different, right? It is inside work for up to 14 hours a day. It is hot and dusty and there's cotton flying around. It is, uh, they're li literally pumping steam into the factory floors. The machines are all running using leather belts and exposed gears. Uh, the noise is pretty incredible. But the boarding house life is really what I think is kind of uh, it makes it successful that this is not a company town, right? This is them having a place to live for a third of their pay, and then they have the opportunity to be a part of the city landscape. Um, this picture is from later in the 1870s, but just to, again, put a face to these workers and see how many of them are all living together in a boarding house structure, um, mostly young women. There are some men because some of the boarding house apartments would have been for men, but also the end apartments on the boarding house structures would have been for middle management. So men with their families. Um, so work-life balance, what's that? I don't know. Um, but in the 19th century, this is totally changing the way that people think about work. Prior to this, you know, there was there was definitely work opportunities, maybe not in mass for women, um, but it might have been that you could be a teacher. It might have been that you could be a domestic. Um, it might have been that you worked on your family's farm or helped your family in some other way. But now we start to see a shift. We start to see a shift in uh, using the clock and having that really drive work. And also having it be that when you sign that contract to work for a year, um, it really is that you're signing on to some other regulations. So let's stop with the timetable, right? Uh, I don't know about you, but my iPhone goes off at a certain time in the morning and then I get ready and then I have to be a report to work for a certain time and then I end my day and I am then have the evening to do with what I will. This kind of typical work and also typically being beholden to a clock and an alarm clock, this is a product of the Industrial Revolution. So the bell schedule on the left-hand side um, is uh, really what starts us to have getting up in the morning, right? In the summer season, you get up earlier because there's the sunlight to take advantage of so that you can work by the sunlight. It's a little bit later in the, in the winter at time. And then you have that you would, the workers would go to work in the morning first thing, they'd have a little bit of time to get ready, they'd go to work. The bell would ring again at about seven or eight o'clock in the morning, they'd have half an hour to head back to the boarding house, eat their breakfast and get back to their machines and turn them on. The bell would ring again then at noon and you'd again only have half an hour to walk from your mill to your boarding house, eat your dinner and then head back to work until depending on the season, six or seven at night. After that, uh, the time was what the workers wanted to do with it. They could spend time in their boarding house relaxing. They could spend time going out onto town. Uh, they could spend time catching up on reading, whatever they wanted to do. This is a little bit different than maybe life on the farm where even after your supper, you might have to do more work, right? You might have to card that wool or you might have to spend some time mending. Um, so now we start to see this idea of free time. So work-life balance, a little bit different. The other piece is about those regulations. Um, so when the young women are signing on to those contracts, they are signing on that they will live in the boarding houses, which are run by boarding house keepers. They will attend church on Sundays. Uh, they will be basically following like a moral code, um, which includes a curfew and making sure that you're back at the boarding house by a curfew time. And just in general, they're not gonna cause problems, right? They're not gonna uh, walk out or will they? Um, they're going to be fine, moral upstanding young women who follow the regulations to work in the mills. That's a part of your contract. And so there's some challenges with this, but there's also opportunity. Um, so these young women coming together, uh, they are, again, they're working during the days and a 14 hour day, I don't know about you, I could not have any energy after a 14 hour work day. 
Yet somehow these women did. They found the time to do their own pursuits. Uh, for example, in the 1840s, uh, there was a group out of one of the churches that was a writing group. They would share poems and short stories and nonfiction narratives with one another. And the uh, pastor there actually worked with the young women to create what we call the Lowell Offering, what they called the Lowell Offering, which was a repository of magazine. It was a magazine. Um, so this was published for about five years in the 1840s. It was totally endorsed by the companies because they said, look, look at our workers. They are so happy that they have time to do this writing. So this is the Lowell Offering. But there's also challenges associated with this work, right? Um, it is very difficult work. It is long hours. And so there's a rebuttal publication called The Voice of Industry uh, that's published in the 1840s that is much more angry at the potential of pay cuts, uh, looking to start a 10-hour workday movement. So some, some of the beginnings of the labor movement start around these young women having time together after work and talking about their circumstances. So kind of just zooming forward in time, the 19th century is very successful for Lowell. Lowell becomes the pattern for many other mill towns across Massachusetts, like Haverhill and Lawrence, uh, and then eventually across the country, right? In Charleston, South Carolina, Columbia, um, places in Tennessee. And the idea of this whole site being based on industry, there's a bunch of mills, right? 10 different mills going on. Uh, 10 different mill corporations, excuse me. Each one is doing a slight variation on a theme. So the boot ta makes towels. That's what we make here at the museum currently. Um, the Middlesex Manufacturing, well, they were the only woolen one that was in town. Uh, the Merrimack Manufacturing Company, they made the calicos. So Lowell tries not to compete with, with itself. But as it is so successful and we start seeing these other towns and these other cities pop up with uh, textile factories in particular, you start seeing competition. And with competition, of course, drives prices down. Um, and so there starts to be that wool is not as profitable over the course of the 19th century because other mills are popping up. The other thing that's happening as the 19th century progresses is that you are no longer starting to, you are no longer being only reliant on that falling water you actually start to see steam engines, right? Coal is, you can see the smokestacks that are burning. We do have some steam engines in Lowell uh, that get stitched together with the hydromechanic power, but other places can now have mills and factories that don't have a river with falling water on them, which means again, more competition. Uh, over this period of time too, the workforce starts to shift and change, so we start to see that because the mills are such a magnet, even though they're they're struggling a bit financially, they still are a magnet for people to come and settle in Lowell. In particular, kind of waves of immigration happen. Uh, that original Irish wave with the canal construction continues, and we start seeing, especially in the 1840s, more and more Irish immigrants settling into Lowell and working in the factories. Into the 1870s, uh, French Canadian population booms in Lowell and you can see how much of the city is really starting to be their neighborhood in Little Canada, as well as Pawtucketville and Centerville across the river. And then that's followed by the turn of the century by Greek and Portuguese, Polish. So this is just a small snapshot of um, some of the different groups that are coming into the city. You can also see how this is shifting the composition of the city from just being downtown factory boarding house life to start to be neighborhoods, right? Like many, many other cities around the country, uh, the neighborhoods are kind of these places where people who maybe speak the same language or have a similar cultural background come together to create their tight-knit little communities while traveling then into the heart of Lowell to work in the factories. And these are just, again, I like to put faces to what we're talking about. These are pictures from a kind of the post-Civil War through the turn of the century to about 1912. And they represent all sorts of people from the kind of quintessential mill girls with the shuttles who were you know, Yankee farm girls traveling here to French Canadian immigrants, Greek immigrants, and then 
moving forward in time, their children, right? They start to not just be here because of the mills, not just working in the mills, but they're really creating lives here. They're creating um, neighborhoods and communities around a lot of them working in the mills, but others work in the school system. Some of them start to work for all the associated stores and um, businesses that pop up, um, like the belt making industry or you know the machine shop, things like that. Patent medicine becomes very big in Lowell. So people, Lowell is very much a working class city, but people are starting to diversify and do different jobs all around the city. And then, like I said, Lowell uh, is so successful, it gets patterned other places. And Lowell is no longer needed to be the center of the textile industry because we don't need that falling water anymore. So where do the jobs go? Well, mills start opening up in the southern part of the United States for a few reasons. Uh, one, it's closer to the cotton product that is uh, that you're need that's needed. And we can talk about that. I see there's a question about that already. Uh, there's also the land is significantly cheaper than up in the northeast part of the country. So the mills and the investors in the mills keep these places running through the 1920s, through the 1930s. The depression hits Lowell very hard a little bit of a, a, a bump because of World War II. Uh, this is actually just post World War II. This is the sign of a storefront, um, but it kind of represents that idea in the 1940s into the 50s that Lowell is really a city kind of in decline because the factory corporations are leaving and it doesn't have as much of that central identity as a textile town anymore. Um, it doesn't have the jobs. It has very high unemployment rates. And so a lot of businesses suffer because of that. So what happens to all these structures if we're struggling um, with not having the mills open? Some of them have different um, uses. For example, Girl Scout cookies are made in one of the mills through the 1970s. Textiles are still made in Lowell commercially all the way up until 2004, but it's pretty spotty. Uh, record needles were made here at the boot. But by and large, a lot of the boarding house structures and a lot of the mill buildings are just big, vacant quote unquote problems. And so there is a push in the late 60s and really in the late 60s, kind of into the early 70s to tear down the mill buildings, tear down the boarding houses. They serve no purpose. If we tear them down, we can maybe build more low income housing or we can build more flashy something that will maybe draw jobs here. Um, we can build a highway that, you know, pulls people right around Lowell and kind of shoots through the downtown and the Lowell connector. So things get torn down, but this creates a really visceral reaction amongst the community um, because some people are saying tear it down and that's how city council maybe is voting. But there is also uh, in the community, people who remember, people who know that these boarding houses and these mill buildings and this canal system, this at one point in time was the peak of an industrial experiment. This was brand new and it's really critical to American history. And so in the 1970s, there's this grassroots kind of effort that's looking at something called historic preservation. And they are trying to get buy-in for this idea. And they're trying to get buy-in saying that we have all these structures associated with the industrial revolution that tell the story of people. So in the 1970s, um, you know, there's lots of names that, th that get thrown around, but the grassroots effort inspires uh, local politicians, in particular House of Representatives later Senator Paul Songus and others, uh, Patrick Mogan, who was the superintendent of schools, to get involved with this idea of bringing the National Park Service in to preserve this history. And when they approached the National Park Service, they actually said, hey, we want to be called Lowell National Cultural Park because we tell people's stories here just like I've been doing this whole time, right? And the Park Service said, mm, we don't do that. That's not a moniker we have. It's still not a moniker we have. Um, but okay, we'll come visit Lowell. We'll kind of see what's going on. And the big hook, the mill buildings were impressive. The boarding house structures that remained standing were interesting. But the big thing that pulled them here was that canal system, that 5.6 miles of canals, that hydromechanical power, the canals in many other cities get filled in. If you ever driven over a canal street someplace, might have been a canal there. 
But here in Lowell, they had not been filled in and all the structures still existed. So that was what made the Park Service said, okay, this is the prime example. This is where we can um, have a site that is dedicated to telling this industrial story. Because yes, we are telling Lowell's story, but we try to broaden that out, right? We are try we are representative of lots of communities and lots of places that have that industrial past. Um, so in June 1978, a little over 45 years ago, uh, President Jimmy Carter signed the bill that would make Lowell National Historical Park Lowell National Historical Park. And how does it go from there? Well, a lot of historic preservation. So um, that's a lot of what the Park Service was doing here in the 1980s and 1990s was restoring and rehabbing um, historic gatehouse structures like the one on the right. The Boot Cotton Mills Museum opened up in 1992. Um, the trolley, everybody loves our trolley, uh, was brought in a historic reproduction streetcar in the 1980s. So uh, the Park Service really is looking at how do we evoke that 19th century industrial past while also moving forward so that people can enjoy it, right? That's the whole idea with behind every National Park Service site. It's for the preservation and enjoyment of future generations. Um, so what can you do here now? Uh, you can come stop by our visitor center on Market Street. It's very kind of a typical National Park Service visitor center, but located right in the heart of a mill building in the middle of downtown Lowell. Our kind of main site uh, where you can really dig into way more history than I was able to give you in 40 minutes um, and actually see power looms operating is at the Boot Cotton Mills Museum. So we operate a 1920s era weave room that and we only maybe run about a dozen to 15 looms, but just even that amount, uh, it's the same as a screaming baby. So if you know what that's like, um, you can hear how loud just a fraction of the machines running in just one mill building are, as well as explore a lot of museum exhibits that talk about Lowell's history. Uh, we have an exhibit that talks about that boarding house life and the mill girl experience. Um, this building is called the Patrick Mo J. Mogan Cultural Center, and it is a restored boarding house. So the outside looks just as it would have in the 1840s, 1850s. And inside we have an exhibit that really talks about, you know, what did they eat for food? How did they spend their free time? And you can kind of put yourself in that position and imagine what their life would have been like. Um, one of our signature pieces, I mentioned the canal structures were what really hooked the Park Service in. And um, what was imagined was to be able to do uh, boat tours on the Pawtucket Canal, so that original transportation canal. We are excited that our canal boat tours, if everything goes well this week, um, we'll be starting kind of uh, after school gets out in June. And we'll be sticking on the Pawtucket Canal. Uh, there's lots of challenges with historic preservation and lots of projects that have to happen um, at our different gatehouses. So we will be using our canal boat out on the Pawtucket Canal, not on the river this year, um, but we will have our boat tour starting kind of mid to end of June. Another really big part of our story that I barely got to touch on um, was those working conditions and the technological advances of the water power system. So every day, uh, actually starting now, we have our Suffolk Mill Tour, which explores a very raw mill space and looks at that powertrain system of turbines. How do we get that falling water and turn it into fabric? This tour explores that in a very raw, musty, humid mill space. When you walked in there, you're assaulted by the Suffolk Mill. It's pretty great. Um, and again, we are always out and about. Uh, the park is the city and the city is the park. So we try to be out, not just in our spaces, but we go to different community festivals. Um, we work with different community organizations and artists to do art in the park, uh, to do programming. So you might see us in Lowell National Historical Park in one of our structures, but you'll also probably see us at various community events and working with different community members as well. And I'm putting a big plug in for something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, for the past five years, we have been working on developing a brand new permanent exhibit at the Patrick J. Mogan Cultural Center. Uh, this is called One City, Many Cultures. So we talked briefly about kind of that immigration story, um, but Lowell's story of people being here 
is 12,000 years old. And it's very dynamic. It is a city. So there's there's not just this Irish story and this Greek story and this Cambodian story. We know that the story is actually very woven together, no pun intended. And so we are opening a new permanent exhibit on September 23rd, 2023, that really explores culture and cultural expression, building community and people transitioning and moving to and from Lowell um, this coming fall. So we hope to see you there. And yeah, so Lowell, like I said, it's, it's very dynamic. It's a city but we just happen to uh, be in the heart of it. We have the privilege of holding some of these stories in these places you know, in our trust for all of you to enjoy. So we really hope that you can come and experience or you can ask me more questions and experience online this industrial city that is uh, living its legacy as a very vibrant community today. Your national park in your own backyard or maybe not in your backyard. <laughs> so excited for these questions though. So folks, let's give Emily a big virtual round of applause for a wonderful presentation. And uh, Emily, let's take uh, roughly 15 minutes of comments and questions. Um, and I know you were peeking ahead uh, at some of these questions and comments. Uh, Jane would like to know, uh, so when did East Chumsford become Lowell? That's a great question. So East Chumsford becomes Lowell in 1826. So the first factory opens in 23 it becomes Lowell in 1826. So there's actually a period of time where East Chelmsford has um, has the, the textile industry rocking and rolling here. So 1826 means that we are planning for some bicentennial celebrations here in the city in 2026. Uh, Marie asks, can you please comment on the industrialist's attitude about slavery? That is a fantastic question. Um, so the industrialist attitude towards slavery is, uh, partially, they endorsed political candidates of the South that, you know, owned people. They also um, very actively sometimes lobbied to make sure that laws protected the institution of slavery in the 1820s. As time moves on and public opinion in the northern part of the United States in the 1820s, 30s, into the 40s, is shifting, we see less and less of them endorsing those candidates and putting money behind protecting the institution of slavery. But there's a lot of kind of, um, I guess, mums the word, where people who are invested in cotton textile industries typically don't speak out against slavery. Um, into the 1850s, we do start to see some more of those people who have financial connections to the mills, they do start to speak out against slavery. So it really is kind of as the tide is shifting and we're heading towards that 1861 big explosive moment, um, the pendulum does swing for some of the investors in the mills. But as you noted, the connection between why this is successful financially is because cotton is based on a slave economy. Um, I also just wanna point out that the workers though, really interesting when you start looking at some of what they say about the institution of slavery. Some of the mill girls are very actively writing abolitionist pieces in the 1840s and 50s. Um, they also very much equate themselves with the slaves in the South. Now, we don't do that today because we know that being owned is very different than getting paid a cash wage. However, their writings, they call them their sisters in the South. So they are starting to equate their struggles with the labor movement and the pay cuts in the 1840s and those kinds of pieces with the people who are picking cotton in the south so that's really interesting um there also are lots of folks who come through um frederick Douglass comes to lowell you know other abolitionists come to lowell to speak to the mill workers to say to raise awareness of the plight and to um kind of garner support for that cause that is a whole other hour long lecture that we can chat about though. So please ask me those questions in an email or come and visit and we can chat more about it in the museum too. Uh, Lois notes, I've taken the canal ride tour. I loved it, it was very impressive. Uh, she does have a question though. Uh, these mill workers would have had no idea what they were getting themselves into. Uh, so was there much turnover? And since they signed a contract, could they easily leave? It's a great question. So they could pretty easily leave um, the contract. Is, they didn't bite anybody in court to stay for that year long. And it really is only a year though. Um, and in the early 1820s and 30s, sometimes it's only 10 months because of the water supply. They have to shut down for a couple months in the summer. That changes as we buy up the lakes in New Hampshire. Um, but it really is that they are 
kind of employees at will, even though they sign that contract, nobody's going to fight you on it. Um, that being said, the reasons that a lot of workers are coming here, they're kind of planning that out, right? They're looking ahead and they know how much they're going to make for that year or two years or three years. And they're probably filling some kind of need either for themselves or for their families. So there isn't a ton of evidence of people leaving really early in their um, contracts, but we know it does happen. Uh, Larry asks, are you not doing the trip onto the river because of renovations? And will you be doing the cruises on the river from the boathouse? So the first part of the question, yes, um, we are not using the lock chambers because of renovations that have to happen to preserve those structures, both at Swamp Locks and at the Guard Locks Gatehouse. So that's the first answer. Um, the river boat um, we are currently using for our school programs, we're looking at our capacity this summer to see if we can um, support any programming out there. It's not going to be every week like we had done in the past. Um, we just unfortunately don't have enough staff at this moment in time to do that, but we are, fingers crossed, going to be doing some special programming using that riverboat this summer is the hope. Um, and then the third part of that question, I believe, was about um, the cruises. So if there's another part, please ask, but. Um, yeah, you, you got it. Uh, the, the, yeah, the question was, will you be doing the cruises on the river from the boathouse? Yeah. Uh, so Marion asks, uh, has there been or is there any interaction with the University of Massachusetts at Lowell? That is a great question. And yes, there is a huge relationship um, between UMass Lowell and Lowell National Historical Park um, in the form of our field trip programs, our curriculum based education programs that we offer for grades two through college. Uh, there is an organization called the Songus Industrial History Center, named after Paul Songus, who helped um, found the National Park here, right, as the senator kind of leading that charge. So the Songus Industrial History Center is uh, both UMass Lowell through the School of Education and National Park Service Park Rangers coming together, thinking that we have the expertise of UMass Lowell in terms of education, and we have these resources of the park. And so we have kids coming, I think we have like seven or eight classes today, and today's quiet. Um, we can have up to 12 to 15 classes coming every day. We see about 40, in a non-pandemic year, about 45,000 students and teachers through that partnership. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, uh, what brought on the union movement in the mills? Were conditions deplorable? It doesn't seem like they were, at least initially, for the mill girls. It's a great question. So um, kind of pre-union, I'm not a super, labor history is not my super big focus, but mill girls is. So in the 1830s, um, the mill girls, that kind of group of workers, um, they are moved to not union organize, but they are moved to walk out in 34 and 36 um, because of rumors of pay cuts is 34 and rumors of increased boarding house rents is in 36. Um, both of them are true in that there were plans being talked about at higher Boston financier levels, um, but neither one was, they were both kind of blown out of proportion, but the workers were pretty disgruntled. So they did walk out. Moving forward in time into the turn of the century, when we start thinking really like that 1912, Bread and Roses in Lawrence, uh, union organizing, it is because conditions have deteriorated and also people are getting more and more frustrated, right? That wages are being cut or not increased to meet the standard of living from the 19th century into the 20th century. And also because there is union organizing going on at cities around here like Lawrence or in New York City, union organizers actually start coming to Lowell and start meeting with workers. And that's um, kind of how that gets started here in Lowell. But it's not my super, I'm not super expert on that. So somebody else might have more thoughts about it than I do. Uh, so an anonymous attendee asks, how do you keep the canals clean? Last time I was there, there seemed to be a lot of tires in the canals. So Emily, where do you keep your scuba diving equipment? I wish I was certified. I would no. <laughs> um, so the canal question is always very interesting. Um, so the National Park Service, I mentioned we don't own a lot of buildings. We don't own the canal system either. Um, we do help with some preventative maintenance, but 
the power company, Patriot Power, which that title of that company has been handed down since 1796 with the Pawtucket Canal, Proprietary Locks Canals. So the power company actually still owns the water rights. And the state Department of Conservation and Recreation owns pieces of the canal structures. And we help manage other pieces. So that's not to try to place the blame on other people for not cleaning the canals. We work very closely with some great um, nonprofit and community-based organizations, the Lowell Canal Water Cleaners and the Lowell Litter Crew to try to do cleanups at locations that make sense, like at gates and um, gate houses and stuff. Um, so we do rotate through and try to do cleanups that we put out there as volunteer activities, uh, but it's not just on us to do it. Um, the, the canal, excuse me, the power company does often bring in cranes at some of those locations of gatehouses about two, one to two times a year to try to pull some of that debris out as well. So it's a work in progress. It doesn't always look pretty, but there is efforts to try to keep it cleaner. Uh, so folks, if you enjoyed today's program, uh, make sure to let Emily know in the chat. Uh, so Emily, I'm gonna transition over to the chat where there's mm -hmm. also some questions. Uh, I believe we've already answered Yvette's first question. Her second question, I think essentially, is were there any toxic chemicals inside any, any of these factories? Yes, and in the 19th century, the solution to pollution is dilution. So let's toss it in the canal and see what happens. Um, so yes, there were toxic chemicals, especially at some of the plants that did dyeing of fabrics. So they would be poured right into the canal system. Um, and uh, not just in Lowell, but there's also some great, not great, they're really horrifying images from like Nashua, New Hampshire, from the paper mills that where dyes are just poured in. So the Merrimack River in the 1970s and the canal system is a product of that too. When they start classifying waterways, they start grading them. The Clean Water Act passed in 1972. They start grading these waterways and the Merrimack River got a D which means it's as close to toxic as you can get without being on fire. So it's basically like a D in school, right? As close to failing as you can get without actually failing, um, which is awesome. Um, but today the Merrimack River is a class B waterway and it's because of federal, state, local, truly community involved efforts to clean up the waterways, um, which involves things like there still is a chemical boom out on the Pawtucket Canal soaking up chemicals today from an old power uh, plant that was out there. And so class B is really good. And people always say, why can't it be an A? Um, we are not a pristine wilderness. So the fact that we're a B while flowing through major metropolitan area, not metropolitan, but major uh, urban areas is pretty exciting to me. It's also the water that I use to brush my teeth every morning, so. Yeah. <laughs> So Emily, I'm, I'm gonna read some comments to you. Um, folks, I'm not, I'm gonna have to skip over some just in the interest of time, uh, but folks, we're really enjoying this presentation, uh, Emily. Uh, Gail says that uh, the park is such a gem. There's so much to do there. Um, Darlene says, awesome job. Patricia says, excellent job. Thank you for sharing your extensive knowledge. Vanessa says, great presentation. She can't wait to go. Cheryl says, great webinar with lots of information. Maxine says, very informative. Uh, Julia recommends a book series. It's a three book series by Lisa Boyle called the Patty Series. It's historical fiction, but it's about the Lowell Mills and a young immig Irish immigrant's journey working in the mills. Uh, the boarding houses, abolitionists, and life in general at that time are spotlighted. So that's the Patty Series, P-A-D-D-Y. Uh, by Lisa Boyle. Uh, Judy says, great presentation. Frank says, great presentation. Vast amount of technological and societal, societal innovation occurred in Lowell and in the park. Uh, the park is a terrific educational resource. The canal rides, the trolley museum, the restored steam locomotive, and the working turbine and textile loom displays. Lynette says, excellent. Michael says, great job. Marie says, thank you. Lisa says, very informative. Joyce says, fantastic. Uh, Lisa is in, uh, looking forward to visiting. Jane says, great program. She's also eager to visit. Patricia says, this was very comprehensive for the short time allotted. Well done. Uh, Virginia says, totally great presentation. Gail uh, again says, thank you. We have spent a lot of time at the Lowell sites over the years. Uh, thank you to, so much to you and your colleagues for all your efforts. Amy says, fabulous. 
Virginia says she learned a lot. Deborah says great presentation. Debbie says, I noticed you mentioned a crying baby. Your little guy must be five months old. I guess Debbie must know you. Uh, Dor <laughs> Dory says, really well done. Thank you so much. Jean says, great talk and information. Uh, she volunteers at the what I think is the Merrimack Repertory Theater mm -hmm. and has gotten to know Lowell uh, somewhat. And uh, Julia is going to wrap us up. Excellent. I cannot wait to visit the mills this summer. Whew. All right. So, Emily, <laughs> uh, any last words from you before we wrap it up? No, I just appreciate everybody's questions and I look forward to seeing you either virtually on our website and other media or uh, seeing you at the park at some point in the future. So folks look for an email for me tomorrow with a link to this recording, a link to a feedback survey, Emily's email address for anyone who has any additional questions, uh, as well as information about some other upcoming programs. I will say uh, we're hosting a talk here, here in person at the Tewksbury Public Library on Saturday, June 3rd at 2.30 in the afternoon. It's going to be the history of railroads in Tewksbury and in Wilmington. And we'll touch on other nearby communities as, as well. So that is going to be in-person only. It won't be hybrid or, or virtual. But if you're in the area, come on down uh, Saturday, June 3rd, 2.30 to 3.30 history of railroads in Tewksbury and Wilmington. And I'll have information about that program in the email tomorrow. So thank you all so, so much. Thank you to Emily. Thank you to all who watched. Thank you to the uh, partnering 50 libraries or so. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks again, Emily. Thank you. Bye. Bye everyone.